Hello and welcome. Thank you for attending this seminar at the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. This meeting is on the record. It will be recorded and shared on EPIC's website, Off the Charts podcast, and social media feeds. Closed captioning is available. To ask a question during the Q&A section, click the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. When called upon, accept the unmute now prompt to ask your question. Your microphone will be muted, but your video will remain off. Good morning. I'm Lindsay Iverson, Deputy Director of the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago and Editorial Director of EPIC's new book, The U.S. Energy and Climate Roadmap. For those of you who are new to EPIC, we're an interdisciplinary center here at UChicago that brings together scholars studying various aspects of what we call the global energy challenge, finding ways for markets to produce sufficient affordable energy to power human development without risking health or the environment. Part of our role as a center is to translate the data-driven work of EPIC faculty for policymakers, media, and the public, ensuring that energy and environmental policy is guided by the best available information. This year, we fulfilled that role in part by publishing a book. The US Energy and Climate Roadmap is a compilation of policy recommendations grounded in the empirical research of EPIC faculty. Its goal is simple, bring academia's best insights to bear on some of the most important issues of our time. It offers detailed, actionable ideas on policies that could make a difference across the economy, such as carbon pricing, as well as sector-specific recommendations on topics such as electricity transmission, which we'll be diving into today. This discussion really couldn't be better timed. From February's devastating cold snap in Texas to this week's heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, 2021 has demonstrated that a changing climate will test the grid in new and increasingly extreme ways. Adapting to the challenges of a changing climate while integrating zero carbon sources of energy into the grid, all while ensuring a reliable, stable energy supply will be a Herculean task. We will hear from Steve Sakala, the author of the Roadmap Chapter on the, grid, on the Grid, and Richard Glick, the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, on all of this in a moment. But first, I'm delighted to introduce Congressman Sean Kasten, who will be making a few remarks to set the stage for their discussion. Mr. Kasten is a self-described climate nerd who's made energy and climate issues the centerpiece of his tenure in Congress. Formerly a clean energy entrepreneur, today he's a member of the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis and the House Science Committee and the sponsor of legislation on climate risk disclosure, energy transmission infrastructure, and more. He also occasionally serves as your friendly neighborhood Twitter wonk, offering in-depth explainers on everything from LCOE, look it up, to the ins and outs of electric vehicle charging policy. Today, he'll be offering a few framing remarks on FERC and its role in the US clean energy transition. Congressman Kasten, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to EPIC. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and uh, it, is, it is truly an honor to be here, and you're right, but the timing really couldn't be better. Um, look, we cannot solve global warming without creating massive gains, gains with a G for our economy, and, I, and I'm not blowing smoke when I say it. I think there are few people who understand that better than the folks at Epic and Chairman Glick. The, the reason for those gains are threefold. Number one, any transition to a clean economy is a massive wealth transfer from energy producers to energy consumers. Um, if we install solar panels, then we don't have to pay for fuel anymore. It's ditto for geothermal or more efficient buildings or wind. Um, if you put geothermal and heat pumps in your house and make your home more efficient and put solar panels on the roof and buy an electric vehicle, you will all of a sudden find yourself for all practical purposes, not having any marginal cost of energy anymore. Um, that creates a really interesting set of conditions and some really interesting challenges that I've um, have enjoyed chatting with Mr. Glick about. Um, and I would point out that that wealth transfer from producers to consumers is the fundamental political challenge of this transition. Um, if you look at red states and blue states, red states are basically where energy production happens and blue states are where people live. That's the wealth transfer from producers to consumers. Um, but that's Piece one. Piece two, why this is such an economic gain, is because the sooner we stop and reverse global warming, the sooner we avoid all of the economic pain that is already coming our way that you alluded to at the start, Lindsay. And I, I, don't, I don't know of anybody who has done a better job of trying to quantify that, both globally and locally, than, than EPIC. And thank you for what you're doing and keep it going. And Michael Greenstone, I know we've been talking about how we might integrate some of the work you're doing into work we've been doing um, on the Financial Services Committee. And actually, as soon as this ends, I have to hop. We're having a hearing on 
two bills that I've introduced to ask our financial regulators to treat climate change as a systemic risk to our financial system, because understanding where this pain happens, understanding where this gain happens, means huge flows of wealth in our economy that are, you know, that stipulate that rising tides lift all boats, but tsunamis can drown folks. And so what's going to happen to those pockets where the money is flowing away from? How do we get the buffers in place? And we're going to do that. But again, Epic has been at the, at the leading edge of that. Now, I mentioned there's three reasons for this. And before I get to the third, um, I, I want to point out that every time I talk to academic economists or people who vaguely remember their freshman macroeconomics textbook, you make the first two points, then someone says, well, you must be lying, Kasten. Because if there's so much money to be made in this, our competitive free market would have taken care of it already. You know, it's it's the old Amory Lovins joke about economists who walk past twenty dollar bills in the street because if if they exist, someone would have picked them up already. The truth is that our energy system has never really been totally a market economic system. Um, we like to tell ourselves it is, and in truth, we probably don't want it to be because we don't really want to live in a world where grandma's ability to keep her insulin cold is a function of whether or not she could successfully navigate the supply demand constraints that caused the price of electricity to spike last hour, right? So we're always gonna be a little bit capitalist and a little bit socialist in our system. We're always, at least for the foreseeable future, going to be unpacking the legacy of monopoly regulations. And of course, in a really capital intensive industry, the barriers to, in, the barriers to capital deployment, the asymmetry of information, and I can't think of anybody who better understands those issues than Chairman Glick. Um, and, you know, as we were talking before we started here about everything going on in Washington right now with the, the infrastructure bill, which we'll be voting on the first piece of the House version later tonight, I think very late tonight. Um, we will see how all that shakes out. I'm cautiously optimistic. But I've said since the start of this administration, and I feel this no less strongly today, that the single most impactful agency in Washington right now to address CO2 emissions is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. If we are going to electrify everything, and if we are going to get to zero CO2 at the pace that science says we must, then we're going to have to build probably about at least a thousand gigawatts of new generation, which is about as much as we already have. We're going to have to install several hundred billion dollars of transmission, which is huge. And for us to do that, we've, we've done it in some scale before, you know, after, after order 888 was passed, we built 200, 200 gigawatts of gas turbines within about 10 years. So 20% of the entire US grid was built in response to market forces. And oh, by the way, we also increased the capacity factor of the nuclear fleet and did all sorts of other climate friendly things. I go back to what I said before, cheap energy is clean energy. Um, but figuring out where we need to make these regulatory changes to really bring that volume of private capital forward, in addition to the federal money that, that's going to happen, um, requires very thoughtful leadership at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and we are very well served by having Chairman Glick there. So thank you again um, for having me. Thank you for having this conversation, and um, I'm sure we're going to learn a ton as we go through, and then keep learning and keep moving forward, because um, we have a narrow window in which, within which we have to act. We got the horsepower, we've got the motive, we just have to act. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman, for those uh, generous remarks um, and for taking the time to be with us today um, and for setting up the rest of today's discussion. Um, it's now my privilege to introduce Richard Glick, the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, FERC is one of those essential federal institutions, a fulcrum agency on which everyday life depends, but which is perhaps understood by too few. An independent regulatory body, FERC governs the interstate transmission of energy in various forms, including but not limited to energy. Maybe we'll touch on that today. Uh, Mr. Glick was named chairman of FERC by President Joe Biden this January, but he's actually served on the commission since 2017 when he was appointed by former President Donald Trump. Prior to joining FERC, he served as the general counsel for the Democrats on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the Senate. I believe I'm right in saying that he's a Mets fan, one of the few fandoms as long suffering as my Cubs, so hopefully he'll feel right at, right at home here at EPIC. Uh, joining him in conversation will be EPIC non-resident fellow Steve Sakala, who is also an associate, who's, who's also an associate professor of economics at Tufts University, 
His work focuses on the economics of regulation, particularly with respect to energy and environmental policy. His chapter in the Epic Roadmap, which we'll talk more about here in a minute, uh, argues that a fully integrated national grid can help the United States decarbonize not just the electricity sector, but also the rest of the economy uh, and offers some recommendations, which we'll hear more about. Um, and their discussion will be led by EPIC's visiting fellow in journal journalism, Rob Meyer. Rob is a staff writer at The Atlantic, focusing on climate change and environmental politics. He's also the author of a newsletter, The Weekly Planet, to which I hope you will all subscribe immediately after subscribing to all of EPIC's newsletters. Um, Rob, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and, and thank you for being with us, uh, Professor Sakala and Chairman Glick. Um, uh, Steve Sakala, I wanna, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you know, the numbers, uh, as, as Congressman Kasson just hinted at, the, the numbers of, suggest that right now we should be building huge numbers of renewables all across the country. Um, if you look at the levelized cost of energy, you know, there are many places where we could be adding wind and way more wind and solar than we're adding right now. Um, but we're, we're, we're not, at least we're not adding as much as we could. And a big part of that is transmission. So what's going wrong here and how can we write the ship? Uh, well, thanks first for, for joining me and having me uh, as well as a, as a guest. It's a, a great question and an important question. Um, there's a lot of history uh, behind what's wrong or what's impeding uh, the, the uh, transition to a, a clean grid at the moment. Uh, part of that has to do with just the, the, the capital intensity. You have really long lived assets sitting around, um, but those assets were built under a different regulatory structure where there are a lot of current interests uh, who very much would like to keep it that way. Um, and that history goes a little something like this. Uh, there used to be, and in many places still are, vertically integrated utilities that have well-defined service areas, and there are local monopolists in those areas. They built and owned the generation plants, the distribution system, and the transmission. And so we don't really have a grid so much as many different service areas that are connected for reliability, but not really for the mass transportation of energy. Instead, the mass transportation of energy for our electrical system is really largely based on our rail and pipeline system. Because on a fossil grid, what happens is you pull the fuel out of the ground in a few select places. For example, a third of all coal in the United States comes from one county in Wyoming. All right, it's moved over a well-developed railroad system all across the country to where coal-fired power plants are that are close to the population centers and then burned close to where it's actually going to be used and sent over the transmission, those localized systems uh, and, and used nearby. That is quite different from what you need for a renewables grid to work because generation has to occur in the exact moment that it's being consumed. And you know, sometimes the wind is shining or the sun is shining better in one place than another, the wind is shining, the wind is blowing better in one place than another. And we also have just very different renewable resources across the country. And so you need to be able to move that power instead of on a rail car and a pipeline on a transmission line. We don't have the transmission lines to do that. So that's the, the short version. And how, how, just give us quickly, how might we fix that? So uh, one of the major roadblocks here is just institutionally how difficult it is to permit a transmission line. This is historically the permitting process of this is at the state level because there were state regulatory commissions that were regulating their local utilities. But now we're talking about an interstate issue. We're talking about moving wind from the center of the country across states that aren't necessarily going to use it to the population centers. And those states in the middle are saying, hold on, why, why would I permit this? It's not going to benefit my rate payers. It's going to cut into the business of my local utilities who want to be the ones selling the, the power somewhere else. And so I have no interest in, in getting behind this. And actually, we'll work very hard to keep it from happening. All right. And so you have a lot of local interests uh, prohibiting you or preventing you from building those transmission links. 
Whereas if you could have just a single venue uh, where someone interested in building a transmission line could go and say, I would like to connect point A in this state to point B, you know, 500 miles away or a thousand miles away even, um, that would streamline the process significantly, reduce the costs of building that transmission very significantly uh, and allow a lot of things that are really just currently not feasible. Uh, and and just to fully tie it back, what's the what's the venue that you propose in the chapter for that national uh, permitting? I, I mean, I think a, a natural place for this is FERC, uh, where uh, Chairman Glick is is leading the way. Currently, FERC is the venue that does these sorts of uh, permitting issues for uh, pipelines, for example, uh, and we've built thousands and thousands of miles of pipelines, because if someone uh, wants to build a pipeline, they have customers uh, on one end who are producing the oil, customer on the other end who wants to buy the oil. They come to FERC saying, here's a contract we have that these people would like to, to move this oil. That's enough evidence to say this is in the public interest. And perm uh, FERC becomes the primary venue to take care of all of these permitting issues. Right. That contrasts very strongly with the individual states and sometimes even counties uh, of a transmission line having to deal with each of these individual hurdles and not having a centralized place where they could go to expedite all of uh, these permits. Thank you. And now that we've we've tied it back to FERC, I'm pleased to bring this conversation, uh, Chairman Rizbeck of FERC. Um, Chairman Glick, could, could you give us your sense of why you know why isn't transmission being built right now uh, as much as it seems like it should be in in your view so first of all i want to thank you i want to thank epic for inviting me to participate today and also congressman caston for his very kind words he's always been very generous FERC, there's very few members of congress that actually pay attention to our commission and we're, we're glad to have him as a fan um you know i think there there, there is transmission being built we shouldn't uh, neglect the fact that there are thousands of miles of transmission being built um, annually. Um, but I think it's not being built to the scale, to the level that we certainly need it. I think as uh, Professor Scala suggested, you know, we are gonna need a massive amount of additional renewable generation, uh, whether that be offshore wind or onshore wind or onshore solar, for instance. And um, they're most often the best resources we have are located in remote areas or places where people don't live, not as many people live. Um, so we certainly need to build out the grid in a much more, uh, significant level than, than we do today. And I think there are, you know, there are several barriers. And Carson, I mean, uh, Professor Sakala mentioned a second ago, uh, siting, which has certainly been a big barrier. And it is, it is an issue. You know, some states don't necessarily have the incentive to uh, approve a transmission line that's going to go through their state to send power from the state next to them to another state, to, to, the, to their other side. And so I think that is certainly one of the issues. But there, there are other issues as well. For instance, um, uh, transmission planning. Do, how do we plan for transmission? And, and it's something that FERC does have jurisdiction over. And we are ne not necessarily planning uh, in, in, in the best the best way so far. And essentially, a lot of times we look at local lines, lines to address a, a local reliability issue. We aren't necessarily considering what's really needed. What's the grid going to look like in the future? And where, where do we need to access the generation? How do we improve our, our processes to make sure that we build, we, we know which lines are going to need to be built and where they're going to need to be built to? In addition to that, probably the biggest uh, impediment, in addition to siting, is cost allocation. No one wants to pay for. Everyone wants transmission, but no one wants to pay for it. Uh, and um, you know, it's it's uh, one state will say, well, the guy next to me should pay for it. He's benefiting more. The courts have told FERC, and we we are the agency essentially responsible for allocating the cost of interstate transmission, is that we have to um, allocate those costs uh, roughly commensurate with the benefits. And in the past, we've been looking at beneficiaries in a very narrow way. So for instance, if you get power from a particular line, you're considered a beneficiary, but if you don't, you're not. But the fact is people are benefiting greatly when transmission is built, even if they're not necessarily accessing directly uh, the power that's transported along those lines. For instance, transmission lines um, uh, certainly uh, are, enable uh, states and, and others to achieve their, their, their carbon reduction goals. Uh, but transmission lines also reduce congestion on the grid, and that actually increases reliability for consumers. It also allows them to access cheaper sources of power elsewhere if, they, if, it, if, if congestion on the grid is reduced. So one of the things we need to do is figure out, is there a better approach to how we allocate the cost of transmission? Where are you seeing the cost 
allocation problems come up because I think one thing that uh, Steve was talking about is that there are also places where transmission would be would be beneficial or profitable to generators or to uh, participants in the grid system who simply cannot, you know, get get permitting or siting, you know, a bit, uh, cannot permit or site it right right now. So, wh where are you seeing the cost allocation issues come up? Um, a, a big area is MISO, the Midwest Independent System Operator. Um, covering a big part of the, the middle part of the country where there's enormously great wind resources. And, and even in the southern part of MISO, there's actually a significantly uh, a good uh, solar resources as well. And the problem is, is that they, they're, they're, they have a whole bunch of transmission on the books that they want to build, but they're having a problem getting people to agree to pay for those, those transmission facilities. And so essentially they've been trying, they've been having a, a number of discussions internally among the various states that are involved and among the various utilities that are involved in that particular region, try to get them to agree to an approach. In the past, they, they actually had one big build out about 10 years ago, a very successful build out of transmission. And they everyone came to a consensus about how to allocate those costs. They've been having a very difficult time replicating that. And for consent some work to make sure that those, when it does approve or when there is a new regional transmission project that it's uh, assigned competitively, right? That, that it's built through a competitive process. Is that helping this planning process right now? Well, it's, it's, it's been a little bit counterintuitive in, in the way that that has worked out. Essentially what FERC did in order 1000, which was adopted a while, probably about 10 years ago or so, um, uh, is say that uh, to the extent that transmission uh, is, is planned for to meet regional needs or plan, planned in a way to um, address an economic uh, benefit then that particular transmission facility has to be competitively bid out. And that, presumably that's, that, that would hopefully be good for consumers, competitively bid out. You have different people interested in building it. The problem is we also said that if uh, you build a, tra a transmission for a local reliability need to address a local reliability need or a smaller need, then the local utility can still build that transmission without being subjected to com competitive uh, processes. And the problem with that is all of a sudden utilities said, well, let's build these smaller lines. We don't need these big long distance lines to access renewables. We, we have to, a lot of smaller uh, problems we have to address. And so what we've done is we've, tell, we, we've given an incentive to utilities uh, to avoid competition by building the lines that aren't necessarily gonna get us to where we need to get to in terms of our carbon reduction goals. So how uh, could FERC bring you to, uh, kind of force utilities or, or bring utilities more into the regional development process given that they seem to have a huge amount of control over what transmission gets built right now? Well, there are various ways of doing it. For one, we, we, could, we could essentially get rid of that distinction and say that you know, local utilities, to the extent they have um, uh, some sort of local right to, to, to build transmission, they could be the, they could have essentially be the, 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 the they could have last, last call on the transmission or essentially they'd be able to build the transmission first before anybody else if they wanted to. And then if not, then you can competitively bid it out. The other way, you can go to the other extreme and say, um, uh, you, every, every, every particular transmission facility has to be bid out regardless of whether it's designed to meet a local reliability need or a more uh, comprehensive need. And we're actually struggling with that right now at FERC. What, what do we need to do to, to remove the, the disincentives that exist today and still promoting competitive markets? And we're trying to trying to get, right now we're working with my colleagues trying to figure out what the best approach going forward is. I, I know you're working in, with states during this process too. Do, do states, do, do PUCs, do regulators come down on one side of this or another? I think different states have different uh, views of that, but we, we actually just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago that we were forming a joint task force with the state utility commission, the Association of State Utility Commissions called NERA, and uh, we're eagerly awaiting starting that process, which will hopefully start uh, later this summer or early this fall. But I think that the idea there is that, you know, we, while we have certainly a lot of control over transmission as it relates to planning and cost allocations, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they, the states have a significant role to play, whether it's regard to siting or even on cost allocation issues. They play a big role in how those costs are eventually allocated. So the thought process is that we sit down with the states and try to develop a, a common approach for some of these difficult issues moving forward, because it, it takes 10 years to build a transmission facility on a good day uh, when we have very little impediments. And so we need to figure out how do we accelerate the process? And I think the best way to do that is having the states and FERC work together on those issues. Is there a chance, you know, when we're talking about, you know, potentially giving utilities kind of first right of refusal on um, building transmission, that the utilities have already demonstrated that they're quite willing to kind of hold transmission hostage, or they're, they're quite willing to, to use their full market power 
um, to to influence the construction of, of transmission and, and what gets built and what doesn't. If we give them first right of refusal, does that then just kind of like <laughs> cede, the, cede the board to them with, since they've already uh, asserted so much control, like recognize that they've in fact taken this hostage successfully? Well, I think, you know, in some ways, utilities have a renewed focus on building transmission in large part because they're not making money on the generation side. For those that are, that are still vertically integrated, the fact is the power prices aren't necessarily as high as they once were, and they're not projected to, to, to go up much in large part because of the advent of some of the, 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 the progress that's been made on some of these renewable energy technologies. And so I think they see transmission as a, as a better deal, a better investment for them. them. So I think they, they want to make the investments. And from our perspective, we just want the investments to be made and the transmission to be built. We're not necessarily suggesting who should build. The one caveat is, is if you have an area where utilities are vertically integrated and they have, they have electric generation that they don't want to be subjected to competition. So they keep, they, 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 it's their goal to maintain congestion in a particular region in order to keep their, um, uh, their um, generation competitive against others. Um, that would be a concern if you, if you gave utilities that particular, if you gave them a bigger role in terms of building transmission. Um, but I think a lot of that, that, that issue exists today. It's something we need to wade through. As I mentioned earlier, we're still trying to figure out what the best approach is at the commission. Uh, when might we hear uh, the approach that you've gone with? So uh, we all, everything we do, we, all, we certainly have to get a majority of votes at FERC, and that's yeah. not always easy. We have five commissioners with five different views as, as it's designed and as it should be. Um, my, very, my great hope is that we will have an outline of an approach going forward, a, a pretty detailed outline from an approach going forward before the end of the summer. And then my hope, my great hope is that by the end of next year, we'll have a, a new, whether it be rulemaking in place or some sort of regulatory approach in place, uh, providing some of these enhancements, especially on cost allocation and planning. Um, can, to, to back up a little bit, uh, you know, one of Professor Sakala's comparisons is between the natural gas pipeline infrastructure, which all runs through FERC uh, and transmission, which is more, much more convoluted. As someone who's involved in both processes, what's the difference right now between, you know, siting, approving, and building a natural gas pipeline versus the amount of work involved in building transmission? So I want to go back and say in 1938, Congress gave FERC's predecessor the authority to site uh, interstate natural gas pipelines, but at the same time didn't obviously give us the authority over, over interstate uh, electric transmission facilities. And so uh, the way the law works is basically uh, uh, when someone proposes a pipeline, they come to FERC, we have to issue a certificate of public convenience and necessity. And if we do, they generally go ahead, build the pipeline and start operating it. Um, and there are, states really have very little role to play except with regard to uh, 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 water quality certificates that they have to issue under a, a different law. But for the most part, uh, FERC preempts the states and uh, FERC gives a thumbs up even if a state opposes the, the, the project, they can't do much about it. And uh, in addition to that, um, pipelines actually get eminent domain authority once they get the certificate and they're able to take private land. And as a, as a result of a Supreme Court decision issued just yesterday, yes. public land now, state-owned land um, as well. And so they, it, it, they pretty much have carte blanche once, once they receive a certificate to move forward and build the pipeline. Whereas on the electric transmission side, primarily states have the authority there are some federal entities, federal utilities, power marketing administrations, for instance, and TVA that also build transmission and they, they do that pursuant to federal authority and they do have federal eminent domain rights associated with that. But for the most part, uh, most of the transmission built in the United States is built uh, subject to state regulatory authority. FERC does have some very limited authority with regard to what they call backstop siting authority if the state fails to act and that transmission is proposed in a particular energy corridor, it's, it's a little complicated. But no one has successfully utilized that authority to, yet, and FERC's had that authority over 10 years, meaning that nobody has come to FERC and said, we need you to uh, uh, backstop or over oversee a, a, state, a state failure to act on a transmission line. Uh, do you think it would be easier if FERC had the same kind of authority for transmission as it does for natural gas pipeline? Yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, certainly it would be uh, from an efficiency perspective, a government efficiency spectre, perspective, it certainly would be would be easier. And, 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 and I think you would eliminate some of the concerns that were mentioned earlier about states not having necessarily the incentive to approve a, a transmission line sited through their, their facility if the power is going to another state. Um, but I would caution, I think that's, uh, that's <laughs> the, the, the FERC siting, interstate natural gas pipeline siting process is very controversial. 
uh, people are, uh, there are a lot of people unhappy with the process. I've actually descended on a number of our orders as well. I don't think we've done, we've necessarily always done the right thing in those setting, setting roles. Um, so I think it's gonna be difficult to get something like that through Congress. I think there are people on the left, people on the right, both opposed to giving the federal government additional citing authority. But if we did have that authority, it, there's not a doubt in my mind, it would be a more efficient process. Have you talked with Congress or, you know, when lawmakers are working on bill text, just what, what's FERC's role there? Do you, are you asked to consult? We, we were often asked for technical advice and we're certainly uh, glad to give it. Um, so if people are thinking about legislation that would give FERC more authority on siting and we, we just give them advice on how we do it with natural gas pipelines and how it might work on the electric transmission side. Um, but it's not our job to advocate for a particular position or not. We just let, let obviously members of Congress and others decide that. Um, I, I, I said, Press, I mean, how much, how much do you think a kind of game changer national authority for FERC would be on transmission? As I mentioned earlier, there's kind of a three-legged stool, right? We're yeah. talking about impediments to transmission, of planning, cost allocation, and siting. And I think certainly it would be it would have a significant impact if uh, the, the transmission siting process were, uh, were were improved and made made more efficient. But I also don't want to leave the impression that 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 would be the end all and be all. Because even if you had a a, good, a better siting process, you'd still have to work out the planning and more importantly the cost allocation issues. Otherwise, a lot of these projects still aren't going to get built. Is that something that you think the Biden administration should like give more priority than it's giving? I think the, the Biden administration is giving enormous priority to, to yeah. transmission. Whenever you ever heard a secretary of energy go around the country, talk about electric transmission, like secretary Granholm is doing, uh, when have you seen legislation, uh, infrastructure legislation, for instance, that, that has billions of dollars proposed for building out additional, tra additional transmission lines? I think they're giving significant authority. They know that the clean energy transition that's underway isn't going to succeed unless we build out the grid. I think the problem is, of course, is you have to get Congress to agree on, on an infrastructure bill, and they're working on that right now. But there's also, as I mentioned earlier, there are federal there are federal utilities, especially in the Western United States, there are huge transmission owners, and huge developers of transmission. And I think there, there's also potential for additional, providing the federal government additional financing to build transmission on their own. Um, what's the most important thing? Mm. This is almost just for my purposes, but uh, as a term, but like, what's the most important thing that Congress could do as part of this one or two deal package that would change the transmission you know, the, the current transmission realities at their today? Well, one of them is certainly, I think, as I mentioned earlier, financing of, of federal trans, federally built transmission, I think would be a big, big uh, game changer there. Secondly, I think clarifying our authority with regard to cost allocation. Um, uh, I think there, to the extent we have a, a greater authority that Congress would provide to us, in terms, or a more clear authority, I should say, that Congress would provide to us to ensure that how we define beneficiaries. So when we go back to the courts and say, We've allocated costs based on a beneficiary pays approach that we can look at beneficiaries beyond the traditional who gets the power and, 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 and define that as a beneficiary. So that would be helpful from my perspective. That would be one of, one of the very significant um, elements of, a, of, a, of an energy bill that I think would really help unleash uh, building out the grid. Um, stepping back a little bit, uh, what role should FERC play in this kind of energy transition? or in helping states achieve their carbon reduction goals? Like what is, what is FERC's role here, if it has any role? It's a great question. And I think it's an important question. You know, we, we, our role is not necessarily to be, we're not an environmental uh, regulator. Our role isn't to saying that you should, be, you should be reducing your emissions. I think, but our role really under the Federal Power Act is to get rid of barriers. Uh, so one of the things we do is try to figure out are there market barriers out there that are preventing these newer technologies from being developed? We've acted on, for instance, recently on orders related to energy storage and distributed energy resources and, and technologies and such as that. Such as that. Um, in addition, though, on the transmission grid, our, our role, our statutory role is to make sure that the rates in terms of transmission service are just and reasonable. And if transmission isn't being developed, that leads to increased congestion, which also adversely impacts reliability, but also it raises costs unnecessarily, then we need to actually get involved and try to figure out is there a better approach approach that will lead to, to just and reasonable rates in terms of transmission service. Um, and so in, in, in other words, the, the role here is in not you know, boundaries and making the markets work better in, in allowing more um, you know, innovation in the electricity market. 
if a state has a particular carbon reduction goal, does that influence kind of FERC's policy making at all or, or how FERC might see its, its role in working you know, in around that state? So we, we, we've, we've issued a policy statement uh, recently that's basically said that if a state pursues a carbon pricing mechanism, we'll try, and that state is part of a regional transmission organization, we'll try to facilitate uh, that carbon pricing mechanism in, in the regional uh, rate making process. Uh, but outside of that, I think it's, it's I think we're essentially um, agnostic as to whether a state pursues the clean energy policies or not. But our role again is to get out of the way and make sure that the markets don't act as barriers to the state's the state's efforts. Um, what, what do you think, to, to turn on the side, so there's, there's of course, the mitigation side of climate change, and then there's the adaptation side. Um, how is FERC thinking, there's been enormous challenges to the grid this year, of course, a number of them in ERCOT, which is uh, not in jurisdiction, but um, how is FERC, how are the other commissioners, how are you thinking about FERC's role in, in sustaining the grid and it, adapting the grid to the kind of challenges it's going to face, you know, as climate change progresses kind of regardless of emissions pathways. So one of our other responsibilities is for the reliability of the bulk power system. So the big transmission lines, the big power plants around the country, we are, we along with NERC, which is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, are entrusted with ensuring the reliability of the grid. And so we obviously take the role very seriously. And we recently had a technical conference, which is our version of a congressional hearing or something on the issue of grid reliability as it relates to um, extreme weather conditions. And, you know, as you mentioned last week, uh, we saw it, in the, actually earlier this week, we saw it in the Pacific Northwest, we saw it in California and Texas more recently. And then of course, earlier this winter, winter storm Uri, and we saw what happened down in Texas and elsewhere and other parts of the country. Um, and it's clear that the planning that, 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 that utilities undergo with regard to um, reliability, uh, some of the, the methodologies they use, some of the approaches that they use, need to be updated because we're seeing weather conditions that used to happen once in a thousand years now happen once every couple of years. And it's clear that that's going to be happening uh, an increasing uh, level going into the future. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about how do we Im improve utilities ability to um, prepare for uh, uh, extreme weather. One of them is certainly enhancing the transmission grid as we talked about. And one example, you're, you're exactly right, ERCOT in Texas we don't have authority over, over, over ERCOT part of the grid, and that's, you know, if they don't want us to have FERC authority out, that's their, that's their decision. But one of the things we need to do is, I think, is facilitate greater interregional transmission development, because it might be really hot, or really cold in one state, and a couple states to the east or to the west, it might not, they might not be suffering the same extreme weather at that particular time. So they might have extra power they could transport into Texas. The problem is Texas has cut themselves off, basically said, because they don't want to be FERC jurisdictional, we're not going to be able to access power from other states. And that's that we, we we saw some of the ramifications of that. So we're taking a look at that. How can we improve the transmission grid and especially as it relates to uh, the capacity of, to transport power among different regions of the country? Um, do you think the challenges between, I think a lot of the conversation we were having earlier was about uh, intra-regional, like within regions, power sharing with a MISO. Are the challenges for national, like inter-regional, Regional transmission any different than the big ones that we that we were just talking about? Mostly no, except I would say that uh, with regard to transmission planning, so FERC requires pursuant to Order 1000, we require regions to have intra-regional transmission planning approaches. Some are better than others, and we're, we're looking at ways we can improve that. We don't have uh, we don't necessarily have a very good regime for planning between regions. So, for instance, if if if, if MISO and PJM when a, if someone wants to build a transmission line connecting those two regions or better connecting those two regions, um, uh, MISO would have to determine that transmission line benefits them. Then PJM would have to determine that transmission line benefits them. And then they both jointly have to, tr have to determine that transmission line benefits both of them. And that particular process is very cumbersome. As, as I just described, it, it, it can be very bureaucratic and is, is led to, uh, or is, is not led to uh, inter-regional inter transmission development the way some people believe it needs to be done. So. Uh, we need to do that to enhance access to renewables, different regions to access renewables, for instance, but we also need to do it for reliability reasons. And so one, that's one of the things we'll be taking a look at as well. Given that, you know, MISO has a collection of utilities and then PJM has a collection of utilities and they, and then the utilities control this process, like, is that, uh, I know that building transition in the first place is a lengthy process physically, but how likely are we to get significant transmission construction 
given just the number of different entities there, all of which, uh, Mice and PJM a little different, but like all of which, or many of which have incentives to keep their kind of local systems congested or to not uh, be part of a larger market. How realistic <laughs> are, are, are we about, is it to kind of expect that this kind of interregional uh, links might happen? Well, I think that, you know, it requires some, some levers. So for instance, FERC, we have some authority over transmission planning and, and cost allocation. And we need to use that to incent utilities to do the right thing, but also uh, states as well. And many of the states that we're talking about have established very ambitious uh, carbon reduction goals, and they know they can't achieve those just by acting inwardly and thinking about what can we develop in our own state. Sometimes they're going to need to bring, bring um, uh, cleaner power in from other states as well. And so they need to put some pressure on the utilities as well. And then I think third, the customers. A lot of this is not, is not necessarily being, some of it's being promoted by government, but a lot of it is the fact that the utility customers are demanding now that their utilities provide them cleaner resources. And it's not just individual customers, it's their big corporate energy consumers. And corporations such as Anheuser-Busch and Procter & Gamble that weren't necessarily on the list of companies you would think necessarily five years ago would be pushing these things. agenda. And so I think utilities are, are starting to respond and they're going to need to figure out what investments they need to be able to, are they going to be able to need to make in order to be able to adequately provide their customers with uh, cleaner resources. Is the PUC system <laughs> ready for that kind of, you know, are state PUCs understanding the amount of uh, the expectations that have been placed on them by these, by these goals, or even if, you know, lawmakers within a state understand that something isn't, you know, going to be able to be done locally, do the, are the PUCs ready to accept the responsibility that that incurs? Some are. I mean, if you talk, I talked to a lot of state commissioners, and some were very well, very well out in the lead on this effort, so pushing their utilities and, and and figuring out that they need to work together with other states in their region and, and across regional lines to get what get needs to be done done. I think that, that our in a way our system is a little bit anachronistic. We have fifty different utility commissions, and we have a federal commission, and meanwhile these markets are regional in some cases, super regional, and uh, so it, it's not necessarily maybe the most efficient approach, but it is the approach that we have. And I do think that there is there's a lot this significantly greater momentum than there might have been 10 years ago for making these changes in the way utilities uh, plan and operate uh, to achieve what many people believe are is necessary carbon reduction goals. Uh, what do you think? This is the last question that I want to bring Steve back in. But uh, what do you think when you see discussions of climate policy or you know climate activists or climate even policy experts? What what do they miss about the electricity system? What do you think is, I realize this isn't a carbon reduction, isn't a goal of FERC, but when you see discussion of building out the electricity system or of how the electricity system would be important for climate policy, uh, what, what are folks missing? Well, I think, I think some of it is our jurisdictional limitations, but some of it is that, you know, I think we, we have at the same time, we are, uh, trying to get the grid built out for a variety of reasons. We need we, we have other responsibilities. We have to make sure that, the, as I said earlier, that rates are just a reasonable, meaning that they're not too high. Uh, and that also that, that electric service is reliable. And so for instance, uh, I think I very much um, understand and, and, and personally support some of these goals to significantly decarbonize, but sometimes it takes a little bit of time because uh, we have a lot of um, intermittent generation on the grid, and that's growing, whether it be wind or solar. And as mentioned earlier, when it gets cloudy or when the wind stops blowing, you have to have other generation out there. Uh, and it may be fossil generation in the short term, like, like fast acting natural gas plants, for instance, that you're going to need in the short term. You can't just go from zero to 100 without, uh, without making the, the technological advances that you need to make. And I think some people sometimes they don't necessarily understand that we have to keep the lights on at the same time we transition to our cleaner energy future. Uh, Steve, I see you shaking your head at, <laughs> or just uh, feeling frustrated at the number of different institutional actors here. Um, uh, what are you thinking <laughs> as you hear this discussion? <laughs> in general. Do, you, do you have a question <laughs> for Chairman Glick? Well, the, the, I mean, the chairman raised a, a, a number of, of really good points. Uh, when I was, I think, shaking my head the most was, you know, a lot of times when we think about the, the challenge of confronting climate change, we often think of technological ones for how difficult it's going to be technologically. 
to make it even harder for regulatory reasons. Those are, that's just like an own goal. We're making it harder than it has to be. And it's just pure waste to, to do so. But actually one thing that I, I did want to follow on, on the chairman's comments, because we don't talk about it very much was this issue of, of cost allocation. It's a really important one. And a lot of times economists, when they talk about the pricing of, of goods, we generally want the price to reflect the marginal cost of producing a good. How much is it going to cost to produce one more unit? And you want the price to reflect that. So when people are making decisions of how much they're going to use, they're thinking about how much am I willing to pay for one more unit of goods. And when we're talking about transmission, we're generally talking about large fixed investments, that once you've made that investment, the marginal cost of using it is essentially zero. And so there are actually really strong economic reasons to take these costs of building transmission and not pay for them through electricity rates. You're actually distorting electricity consumption away from efficient levels when you insist on having electricity rates uh, reflect the cost of building transmission. And so there are actually really good reasons to say, use tax revenues to, to build transmission lines and take this cost allocation battle outside of sort of who's benefiting from it and they're the ones who should pay. And instead treat this as this is a big lump of investment that we'll need to figure out how to pay for through the tax base, not necessarily through the usage of electricity. I think there's a lot of merit to your argument, um, Professor. I, you know, the, the I think you have to analogize it to the federal highway system, right? So we have we used federal tax dollars to build out the highway system, which is very similar to the electric transmission grid. Now we do have in some cases tolls, um, but for the most part, it's mostly funded by by taxpayers because it benefits everybody. And I think the argument can be made the same as to the as to the transmission grid. I will say that there are proposals out there to provide, for instance, a 30% investment tax credit entities that build transmission to try to incentivize them to build more transmission. And as I mentioned earlier, there are also opportunities in some parts of the country for federal utilities to use federal taxpayer money to build out the transmission grid. Um, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. It just would require a significant uh, change in the way we regulate um, the electric grid. Yeah, so just one more follow on for that. In, in this parallel with the federal highway system is that as we talk about decarbonizing the economy, we're ultimately thinking about what is the cost of driving in a fossil-based car versus driving in an electric-based car or heating your house with gas versus with electricity. And in that decision, the price of electricity is going to be extremely important, right? And so the more we can uh, get the cost of electricity to only reflect the marginal cost of generating electricity instead of these large fixed capital costs that require delivering and all of those things, the more level playing field we'll have between electricity and these other forms of energy uh, in the other sectors of our economy. I would just add quickly that, that that's certainly the goal of the energy markets that we oversee in terms of using marginal cost pricing to help achieve a competitive approach to, to energy pricing. I would say that, that, that and that makes sense from, from an energy market perspective, but there are other benefits out there. As I mentioned earlier, the need to have um, some flexibility in the grid to address intermittency and so on. It doesn't necessarily uh, respond well to marginal cost pricing. Uh, and so that's something that from a regulatory perspective, we're trying to think about is are there ways to properly value and compensate for um, uh, generating facilities that, that provide the type of flexibility that's gonna be needed in the future. It's also a consumer level or a, there's a difference between producers and consumers here, right? In that uh, consumers do feel marginal cost differences in energy, but from the producer standpoint, while an oil company might also feel marginal costs, you know, someone moving from a gas to an electric car uh, that is experienced by Exxon in some way, you know, that, that de decrease in demand is experienced by Exxon. Well, for utilities, my understanding is most of them are regulated in such a way where they may not see in a short term way a kind of benefit from more consumers electrifying. Um, is that analysis right? I mean, is there this kind of like producer consumer difference here too, in terms of just who is experiencing the level, the marginal cost of energy? I think this is a Chairman Glick question, but I'm interested in Professor Scala's answer too. Oh, you defer to Professor Sakala. I think that um, <laughs> I would just say on the, uh, the, the, that I think that um, part of the issue is, is, of course, on the marginal cost issue is that 
consumers don't necessarily, the way it depends on different states, but different states are set up differently. Consumers don't necessarily have the opportunity to respond uh, in terms of changing their energy use based on marginal cost, uh, in large part because um, they may just pay a rolling, a rolling average pricing or they, they may not actually have hourly pricing to, to, to respond to. And that's, that's an issue that some states are trying to address today. But I don't know, Professor, if you had a different view. Um, I, I mean, I think in the in the direction that, that Rob was going, the, the way utilities make money is from owning capital. Exactly. Um, and and then earning a rate of return on that capital, which uh, I think goes to, to a point Chairman Glick was making earlier about whether you allow the utilities to build the, the transmission system or if you build it out. Um, in, in some of my own work looking at what happened when power plants, the generation side was, was deregulated, um, the deregulated power plants tended to use much less capital intensive uh, techniques for abating pollution, for example. Um, they have much stronger incentives to reduce their costs than regulated utilities. So I, I think we're, we're all in agreement that transmission beats no transmission. Um, but at the same time, if we're really concerned about keeping costs down, you probably want to keep it out of the hands with, of people who make the most money when the costs are higher. Excellent. With that, I, I want to bring back in uh, Lindsay Iverson to lead us through Q&A. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, and uh, thank, thank you, Chairman Glick and Steve, for a, a terrific conversation. This has been wonderful.